Hi everybody, it's Evening Ransom and I realized that I had neglected a question from a long time ago on repressed memories that I wanted to make sure that I addressed. So the, the concept of repressed memories and trauma is a controversial topic. It goes way back, it's regression therapy is an old, old therapy that there are things that happen in our lives that are just, we're not capable of handling them. So we, we repress them. It happens automatically. And it happens a lot of times from childhood before you have the capabilities to handle what's going on. You know, it's, it's overwhelming to you, whatever, is, whatever the experience is, and so you repress that memory. The memory doesn't go away. It gets stored. And it gets stored kind of in bits and pieces. So, like you might have the, where the, the sound gets stored and it's sort of compartmentalized separately from the smells, separate from the tactile things, separate from the sounds, separate from the emotional experience. So that what happens is later, you know, so maybe you were had a child was molested when they were very young before they were even able to completely take in what was going on. This was someone that, that they loved, someone that they needed to take care of them. And so they had to compartmentalize it so that they could maintain a relationship with this person because they loved this person and they needed this person. So they were able to go on living by repressing this memory. And then later in life, they could just be going along and taste a certain food or they'll taste, or they'll hear a song or a, a smell or something will trigger an emotional response that they won't understand. You can't talk about repressed memories without immediately getting into a discussion about false memories. And so, because we all know about the times when in the, in the 80s, about the 1980s, they were doing a lot of stuff with really bad therapy where they were leading clients into believing that they had, that, the, that these traumatic experiences happened that didn't happen. And we know that memory is faulty. That it is because people will be absolutely adamant that they know exactly who it was that they saw, you know, do commit a crime and they absolutely know who it was and people will go to have gone to jail and then later uh, through DNA evidence and even even confessions it's proven that, that that wasn't the right person at all even when it comes to that identifying thing we're really bad at identifying because there's even circumstances where people will come back and people will come back to cl and claim to be someone that they don't even look like but it's like a missing person that the family was distraught over and now this person's back and they will accept it and then even look like the person. It's amazing stories like that. I think that you know, if we're gonna err in one direction or the other, I definitely would hate to have anyone not be believed when they are remembering something because my experience is, and I've, I've seen this with so many people and I've experienced it myself, that the repressed memories are very, very real and it can be very baffling and very confusing. So, how do I know abuse happened if I don't remember it? If I don't remember it exactly? Well, there's something you remember because you're asking the question. So there's something there. There's something that you remember. And so follow that, you know, follow that. First of all, ask people, you know, ask people that might know and see what they say. Uh, and this can go, this can go a couple different ways. Either way, you have your answer. Some, in some cases, you might ask people, and they'll be like, "Oh, yeah, of course, don't you remember, blah blah blah, that happened, and so and so, and then we, you know, we went to dinner, and then you know, you you had to go to the hospital for it, you know, like you know, they'll they'll fill it in, and then a lot of times that'll be the beginning, and it'll be like a that we look at the ball rolling, you'll start remembering all kinds of stuff. Also, what can happen is that people will deny it if they feel accused by the question. I had a big chunk of my life that I just didn't remember. Like the first 
basically like the first 15 years of my life, I really didn't remember hardly at all. Start pulling back memories in bits and pieces. I could remember like times with my grandparents or times with my friends or times at school. I could remember those times, but really what stayed gone for the longest time was times at home with my parents. And a lot of times we think of trauma as, we think of trauma as, you know, just terrible events like, you know, people dying and, and you know, car accidents and, you know, violent crimes and wars and things like that. But anything really that doesn't fit together with your narrative or your beliefs about the way that the world is, this thing can't have happened in the world as you know it. So for this thing to have happened would set your world on its on its head. It can be something like you, your family was, you know, they always acted like you had this such a close family. You have repressed memories of that, just memories of feeling lonely, memories of feeling like you didn't belong with this family or memories where it was kind of cold and it, you didn't feel that attached to that. You have repressed it because the story is we're this close family. This very much, this is, this is very much what was real for me. I had this narcissistic family with parents who didn't love me, but that wasn't the story. The story was that we had a perfect family. The story was we had a perfect family and had a perfect childhood. And so everything that didn't fit with that, I didn't remember, which was, you know, basically all the years where I was still really dependent on my parents. So the times when I was at home dependent on my parents, that most of, most of what happened in that time that time was what was missing because whatever was going on there wasn't consistent with the story so I couldn't remember them and that's what we'll do you know it's like you either because you want so you have to do something you know to, to fix the cognitive dissonance you have to do something you either have to change the narrative we, we didn't have a perfectly loving family or you have, you have to change the memories or forget the memories you know so I had, I had filled in the memories with the stories that I heard and that sounded, you know, basically like, it felt pretty much like a memory, um, but I, you know, I realized that I didn't, that I didn't have first-hand memories. I didn't even actually really realize it until I was living with a friend of my, a childhood friend of mine, and we got together with another childhood friend of ours, and and you know, the three of us had grown up together, but and the two of them could share memories that I was in on. I was there, but I didn't remember it. And I, you know, and I realized that I had always just gone along, and felt like I was, you know, felt like I met and remembered it because I was, you know, I was there, and they were like, and and I, I, I really realized I wasn't remembering it firsthand. It was just I was hearing it, and I'd heard it before, and you know going along with it because it was a story, but I wasn't actually remembering it myself firsthand. And so I came home and I innocently asked my mother, like, um, let's see how did I go first. Yeah, innocently asked my mother if she had any idea why I couldn't remember anything. And you know, if she'd help me remember stuff. And I was, and I was completely not thinking that anything bad had happened. I just, I totally just thought I just have a bad memory. That's what I thought, I, thought. I just have a bad memory. Well, she got super defensive. She just got really defensive. And she was like, I don't know what to tell you. Like basically acting like I was accusing her of something. And so then I did get suspicious. I was like, geez, what is she so afraid of? What is she hiding? And, um, and you know, honestly, I don't know what she was thinking. I don't know what she was thinking. I mean, there could be some big, deep, dark secret that I still don't remember. The true, the true horror of it was where I, you know, came to basically figure out based on, t you know, present time behaviors and stuff was that they just didn't love me. And so I don't know what she was thinking I was gonna remember or what she was thinking I had forgotten um, because I haven't, I still to this day haven't, you know, come up with, you know, any big, remember any dramatic, you know, terrible thing. I just think it was just an, it was just that overall reality of that we didn't have this perfect family. But I don't know what she was thinking. I don't know what her reaction 
I don't know what that reaction was all about. I asked my brother, and I also, you know, we did have a, we did have an idyllic childhood. It was, you know, all that. Um, but he did, he did tell me a few things. He said, yeah, well, you know, we had so and so living with us for a few, for a while, and I didn't remember any of that. He remembered a lot of details that I just totally did not remember at all, not at all. And what, basically, what will happen is that the memories will be repressed until a time comes when. And your subconscious basically perceives that you're in a safe enough place or you're strong you can handle it and then things will start bubbling up to the surface so the memories when they're repressed aren't gone and they're not gone forever <laughs> you know so this is the thing is that what what we have is a coping mechanism in childhood what works for us in childhood to get away from pain ends up sort of backfiring on us as adults and so you really, no one really gets to skate on through with their repressed memories without going back and figuring out what happened and, and, and healing that trauma, you know, making a different choice. And so what will end up happening is, is that the cognitive dissonance, which in my mind is the root of all depression. In my, in my mind, cognitive dissonance was absolutely the root of all my suffering as an adult. It was just the confusion of not knowing, of just, there were so many lies in this narcissistic family and it was so subtle and there were so, there were, they, you know, they were so dishonest with, even with me, that I could never get a straight answer on anything. And so it, it took, you know, digging through lots and lots of confusion. If you're confused, if you find yourself confused a lot, that's usually a, a red flag that you are dealing with emotional abuse and cognitive dissonance. That that just that just goes right together. The confusion is really one of the one of the hallmark signs of this kind of abuse. And I remember just being that was the that was the predominant feeling, more so even than you know sadness it was just a confusion i just didn't understand my life i didn't understand my reactions to things i didn't understand people's uh, my family's reactions to me i didn't understand i just felt like um i didn't get it i felt like i just didn't get i didn't get it i didn't get like how the world operated it didn't seem like everyone got the, everyone got the manual on how to how to function in life and i didn't get it you know it was just you know i felt found it really confusing and so basically what ended, what ended up happening in my case was that I got I got really sick and then the truth about my family and my husband and everything came through and they just weren't there they completely abandoned me and so then there was no more cognitive then then the truth was out on the out on the table you know they didn't love me they weren't there for me and now it's all out on the table and so the confusion went away, the cognitive dissonance went away, and so as awful as that was, I was less depressed. It really was, em em embracing reality was brutal, but it was also the beginning of my being able to take charge of my life because I, I knew what was going on, I knew what I was dealing with. The process is not an easy one. The process is a tearing away of your childhood innocence, a tearing away of your beliefs about how the world was, your beliefs about who the people were, and a lot of things. And truth wasn't what the story was you told yourself. Coming to terms with that is painful. It really is just, it really just is painful coming to terms with that. You are in a therapy situation and feel like you're, you keep being led. To, you know, if they keep bringing up abuse that you don't remember happening, that's that's not good therapy. The, the therapist should be following your lead and letting you letting you lead the way. And we start saying that that you think something happened, and then they can they can follow up with that follow that line of thinking. But shouldn't be putting anything in your in your head. You know, shouldn't be suggesting to you that you were abused or you know giving you some some idea that have this be a valid problem you need to be able to say that you were abused you just don't want to be leading you don't want to be led by a therapist you don't want to be leading your clients suggesting anything that they're not coming up with themselves and so um you know the best thing to do if you 
believe that you have some repressed memories is just start making a case for it. Why do you why do you think there's something missing? No, you just have a big blank in this period of time, and that's for sure. Then you know something. You know you you know you got a big blank. Uh, so find out what happened in that big blank. Could be nothing, but you, you know something. You did you were alive, so find out what happened. You do have repressed memories in that case. You don't know what that means, but if you don't have any memory, then you know something happened to your memory. You know, just ask around if you've got people that you can ask that were there. That's a good place to start. If and if they tell you, that's great. And if they have a big reaction where they're not telling you, that's also telling you something because we cannot not communicate. Do what you're, if they did what my mother did and you know refused to say anything, then she was telling me something. She was telling me that things weren't perfectly great. You know, you know her reaction was really quite shocking and got me way more worried than I was before I had asked. You know, I I asked innocently, and by the time when she had that reaction, I was like, "Oh my God, what's going on? Is, is it, was is, did something happen?" You know, I didn't think so before I asked. You know, get evidence where you where you can, and then just sort of make make a case. Where there's smoke, there will be fire. You know, there was a book called The Courage to Heal. I think that's what it's called. It's a book I remember reading about this same period time period when I was asking my mother that question. It's a great big thick book and it's basically about this very thing and the theory of that book is if you if you think something happened just go ahead and and go with that and take care of yourself and I think that's probably a pretty safe way to be a court is a courtroom is where this whole thing got to be a got to be an issue and because of the stuff that with the bad therapy and the 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 leading stuff that they were doing way back in the 80s and those big courtroom things that happened where there were those false memories. Memory is not perfect. We do have false memories. But if this is not a court situation. You're missing a big chunk of your memory or you have, you're having a visceral reaction around somebody or you just have an uneasy sick feeling around something. Those are legitimate, those are legitimate things. Not knowing exactly what it is, or that there's something that, that's not a necessarily a false memory. There's still something legitimate about what's going on, you know. Just because I don't have a clear memory of some some terrible molestation or something, you know, I don't have that. But that doesn't that doesn't mean that there wasn't something very significant and legitimate going on there. My guess is a lot of what is a lot of what that is about is what wasn't happening. In my case, I believe that a lot of the, tra the childhood trauma was about what wasn't happening, what wasn't there. Um, and what wasn't there was attachment, closeness, cuddling, comforting, you know, bedtime stories, um, an attached, present, available, emotionally available mother. That was not that was not there. And my guess is that's a lot of what this trauma is about. And because that wasn't the story I told myself about my mother, I couldn't remember, I could only remember the time, the things that were fitting with the story I was telling, which is why I could remember being with my grandparents, which is why I could remember playing with my friends, which is why I could remember being at school, but I couldn't remember the times alone with my mother. But just because there was nothing, you know, no horrendous crimes happening or something doesn't mean that it was a false memory or doesn't mean that it was a, not a legitimate memory. It absolutely was significant and legitimate and, um, and a source of, of pain that I needed to heal. So it's enough just to know that, that there was a reason that I repressed that memory to go in there and, you know, excavate that reparent myself through that, face the pain of the non-attachment and reparenting myself and not not repressing my memory, it will heal it. And the healing is actually fairly fast and, 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 and long lasting, you know, permanent. But if you don't do that, this, this unhealed thing will always be there as this kind of festering wound. You have to be willing to go into it excavate it, identify what it is, and heal that. And it's, it's actually, once you do that, it's not, it's a pretty, pretty fast and permanent process. But avoiding it 
and doing all the things you have to do to avoid it for it can go on for many years I mean you can go on for the rest of your life and just sort of suck you know suck away your energy and your happiness over something that really is you know and a lot of times we do that out of fear of what's there you know fear about oh what is it that what is it that I'm what horrible thing is it that I'm trying not to see and so you know you have to realize at some point that whatever it is you 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 can you're strong enough to face it going to to the rest for the rest of your life without facing it really isn't an option that's uh that's the story on repressed memories trauma and false memories so to the person who's asking me that question, I really am sorry I took so long to get to it. I completely, it was a complete oversight. And, um, but I, I, when I found that today, I said, I will be the next thing I do, the next video I make. So there it is. Okay, thanks so much, you guys. I'll talk with you later. Bye-bye.